the planet's children. 29. Until the mass production of the Victrola began in the 20th century, only the rich could really afford to hear music. Recorded music makes possible the democratization of pleasure. It's possible for each individual now to come into contact with any and all kinds of music and to carry it with them. 28. The divided city of Berlin was ground zero in the intense, bitter ideological conflict between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. after World War II. In 1961, the Iron Curtain dividing Berlin became visible as the East German government built a 28-mile wall around West Berlin to close it off from the communist world that completely surrounded it. The wall was put up in order to stem the flow of people trying to leave East Germany. But it was an obscenity straggling across the city of Berlin. The wall was, of course, the symbol of the Cold War. And as all evil walls, it had to come down. In 1989 and 1990, popular reform movements across Eastern Europe threw the communists out of power. The head of the USSR, Mikhail Gorbachev, didn't interfere. Within a year, the Soviet Union itself was gone, as one by one, its republics declared independence. But after half a century of terror and of police state, the people of Eastern Europe and the people of the Soviet Union itself couldn't stand it any longer. The wall was torn down by the people it once divided. Gorbachev deserves great credit for the way in which he went along with the peaceful dismantlement of the Soviet system. After a 45-year struggle between the two nuclear superpowers that terrified the world, the Cold War miraculously ended peacefully. Twenty-seven. Beginning in Mexico in the 40s, the agronomist Norman Borlaug developed a hybrid strain of wheat that tripled crop yields, for which he won a Nobel Peace Prize. Other super grains soon followed. The Green Revolution, brought about by high-yield agriculture, now feeds most of the world by growing more food on less land than ever before. 26. When midwife and nurse Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in America in 1916, she was jailed for it. She went on to be the driving force behind the development during the 1950s of the first reliable oral contraceptive, the birth control pill. One of the major achievements of the 20th century is the idea that women could decide if they were going to be mothers, if they were mothers, how many children they were going to have. This was an incredibly liberating possibility. To date, Hundreds of millions of women worldwide have used the pill. 25. In 1962, former Fish and Wildlife Service employee Rachel Carson wrote an eloquent book warning of the deadly consequences of the use of chemical pesticides like DDT. Her image of a silent spring woke the world to the interconnectedness of the damage we are doing to the planet and the urgency of taking action. By doing so, she inspired a new environmental movement with a global vision dedicated to the health and survival of all species of life, including our own. 24. It's hard to imagine what an astonishing magic trick motion pictures must have first appeared to be. A moving painting in light, telling the stories of people nothing like us and just like us. A diversion from the cares of daily life. It wasn't until D.W. Griffith in the uh, second decade of the century that people suddenly began to recognize that this was a new art. But beyond the fact that it's an art form, equivalent to that of theater, equivalent to that of painting and music. It is the great documentarian uh, of all peoples. Moving film has made possible 
a historical record which hitherto never existed. If we had had film in the, age, in the days of ancient Greece, my God, what, what a sense of history we could, we could have. Motion pictures have changed our perception of how other people live, think, feel, act, and behave. We all modeled ourselves to some degree on people in the movies. I hope to become something like William Powell, or Robert Montgomery, or Rex Harrison, urbane, graceful, witty. But I failed in that. Make a what I said. In addition, they were very entertaining. Movies are the distinctive art of the 20th century. 23. There's a professor at Princeton who used to say, if I drop my glasses, they will break. If I drop my keys, they will not break. Why is that? And nobody could answer that question. By developing quantum mechanics, physicists have unlocked the secrets of the structure of matter on the atomic level. Why are things the colors they are? Why do they feel the way they do? The most basic questions that you have about science, about the everyday world, that can now be answered. Science and technology will never be the same. 22. Bill, hi. I just got your video message. At the end of the century, we're all transfixed by what's happening in cyberspace. Less than 10 years after the World Wide Web turned the Internet into something anybody could navigate, more than 100 million people are surfing the net. Email, you're now writing to a great aunt who would never have put pen to paper to before. You can contact people across the world. The scholars, amazing research. It gives full reign to the imagination. The whole business of selling things on the Internet, the commerce of it, the time of coming in the next century when it will change everybody's life. 21. If you go back to the turn of the century, most educated people believed that evolution took place, but they had no idea how evolution took place. They had no idea why a son would resemble his father. But in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick worked out the chemical structure of DNA the coding that allows genetic information to be copied and passed on from generation to generation. They had discovered the instructions for how to build life. Already, we can design bacteria that can produce human insulin for diabetics and grow replacement livers in the lab from a single cell. We're going to be able to do so many things by manipulating biotechnology that the real question is going to be, what do we want to do? 20. Where would the automobile be without roads on which to drive? By the end of the century, millions of miles of highways around the world have brought mobility and individual freedom for the average person on a scale never seen before. 19. In the 19th century, people worked from dawn to dusk in the mills. Small children worked in sweatshops. What saved capitalism from class conflict between the rich and the poor from communist revolution was the fact that workers began to organize within the system. They raised wages, reduced hours of labor, in effect, humanized capitalism. And it was the humanization of capitalism which preserved it. I think uh, every capitalist ought to be very grateful to every labor organizer for what they have done to defend and put a human face on the system. Our countdown of the 100 greatest achievements of the 20th century continues when we return. <laughs> On this 10th day of June, the hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. Radio is a bigger development probably than any of us can conceive today. Uh, hello, Kay Kaiser speaking. Kay Kaiser? <laughs> well, what strikes you so funny, Kelowna? <laughs> I put in one plug and I got another. It was, of course, the first sound medium that brought you events, 
in real time as they were happening. A big prize fight of 1927 is broadcast live. One man has a heart attack because the excitement is so intense. You know, that sense that you can be in your own home hearing a prize fight, hearing a president give an address. Where it can stand up and be counted. And we will build the planes to bomb Tokyo and Berlin. Radio makes people participants in the history of their time. This is William L. Shirer speaking from the forest of Compiègne, where Adolf Hitler today is handing his armistice terms to France. If I had to pick an absolute moment when the world changed because of media development, I, I would say it was radio. The whole ceremony is over in a quarter of an hour. 17. At the turn of the century, the automobile was a novelty item, affordable only to the rich. But a farm boy named Henry Ford changed all that using standardized parts and a constantly moving assembly line. The assembly line meant that workers no longer had to run around the factory getting parts and assembling them by hand, but were rather fed all these different parts. It meant that instead of taking a couple of days to assemble a single car, it took a couple of hours. The price dropped to about a third of its original price. By 1927, a new Ford cost only $290. What Henry Ford gave to the world was a very cheap form of transportation so that the mass of people had mobility. Ford's mass production techniques have become standard for all manufacturing. What mass production meant was more cheap goods of relatively high quality, affordable by everyone, than at any time or place in the history of the world. Sixteen. Television is perhaps the most amazing invention of the century allowing moving images and their sounds to be transported instantly across great distances without any wires. Its impact on the way we live our lives is incalculable. I'm a great fan of television. Someone who lives alone, it's much easier with television. It's always there, you always get to pick. You know, you, you get a little utopia in your home. With television, we can not only see somebody, we can judge their character. In fact, the whole premise of the presidential debates is that when we watch them on television, we can learn their inner psyches. The emotional part of the images on television almost transcends reason sometimes. It's allowed more people to have a first-hand glimpse of what's going on. So long as you both shall live. I will. It could bring you what was happening as it was happening. At its very, very best, television is the greatest educational tool there could be, making us understand the world forces, making us see the character of leaders, bringing the world together. This amazing global village we live in. Fifty. Go ahead, Mr. President. This is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. In the 20th century, for the first time, you can call across the country or the ocean, from your car or from the air, as easily and as clearly as you used to chat with your neighbor across the back fence. Telephones have revolutionized the way in which we speak to each other, made possible a, a mobile society. Whether we are hardwired, fiber optically connected, or satellite linked, in the telephone age, we are closer than we've ever been before, from farther away than we ever used to be. 14. In the early 1900s, there were fewer than 10 democracies in the world. Now there are more than 100. This has been a great century for human freedom. And surely when people look back from the far future, they'll say that one of the great achievements of the 20th century is that we went from a state where democracy was something that was just practiced by white males in a few isolated places to something that was practiced by people in most of the world and believed in and sought for by just about everybody else.
13. One of the more devastating diseases at the start of the century was poliomyelitis, also known as infantile paralysis. As with most diseases at the time, we knew nothing about how to prevent polio or even treat it. In the worst cases of paralysis, victims were unable even to breathe on their own and often died. When there was a threat of a polio epidemic, children stayed home, movie theaters were closed, swimming pools were closed, people would flee the city in order to protect their children from polio. There was no preventative, which is what made it so scary. Everyone seemed to be working to come up with a safe and effective vaccine, but Dr. Jonas Salk was the first to succeed in 1952. Worldwide vaccination programs have brought about dramatic declines in many of the most deadly diseases known to man. 80% of all children are now protected from polio. Smallpox has been completely eliminated. Through immunization, humans have finally found a way to win a war with viruses. 12. Better food supplies and control of diseases have increased the life expectancy of the average baby more in the 20th century than in all of human history. 11. Einstein wasn't just one of the greatest brains in the 20th century, he was one of the most brilliant people of all time. It's a myth that Einstein was a bad student. He did okay, he got good grades, but he did not get along well with his teachers. Because of this, the young Albert Einstein could not get hired as a professor and took a job at the Swiss patent office. He had this independence of mind that he was able just to break with all the ways of thinking that the physicists had in the past. In 1905, when Einstein was 26, he began publishing cosmos-shattering papers in which he concluded that everything is relative and interdependent. Time and distance, mass and energy, the force of gravity and acceleration, everything except the speed of light. If I'm looking at a clock, and if I'm traveling away from the clock at nearly the speed of light, then the clock is going to look slower because it takes the light a while to catch up with me. And Einstein said that's not just an illusion, the time actually is going slower at this point. When Einstein's relativity theory was proven true during a solar eclipse in 1919, he quickly became the most famous scientist in the world. Before Einstein, time was just there and progressed forever in a uniform way. Space was just there and extended infinitely in all directions in a uniform way. And it was something that you just accepted. Einstein's universe defies classical physics and common sense. But without it, there would be no nuclear age, no lasers, no electronics. One of the most amazing developments of the 20th century, clerk in a patent office, Albert Einstein, comes up with a whole new way of approaching physics that just formed physics for the 20th century in a complete break with the physics of the past. When we return, the countdown continues with the top 10 achievements of the 20th century. Hey. This is for those ready to hit the road. Hit the road. This is for the long the way long home. long way home. This is for those who want to widen their horizons. This is for the passing lane. <laughs> this is for right now. Right now. Hit the road for 2.9% APR financing and you can get average finance savings of up to $16.18 on a 2000 Grand Prix GT. This is for me. For me. Hit the road for Pontiac driving excitement. This is for me. This is my invention. The silverware instrument. And the pneumatic heroes. You could slide them, but they don't slide by themselves. It worked. It worked. Head light. It could change somebody's life. 24 hour thunder. That is the greatest idea I've ever came up in my whole life. It's happening again. Where's it centered? I got it. It's centered on Elwood Drive. Go, go, go. Back. All the way back. 2.7. Yeah. 2.9. Oh, I'm 
feeling it. Go, move it, go, go, go! go. Yeah! Oh! I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico! Yeah! Geico Direct. A 15-minute call could save you 15% or more on car insurance. The King brothers. Separated at birth, George King went to a family that subscribed to fishing magazines. James's family subscribed to the Wall Street Journal. 28 years later, George lived with his parents, while his brother James started a B2B web company and went public with a record first day pop. Food for thought, especially since you can get 13 weeks of the Wall Street Journal for just 57 cents a day. That's 25% off the regular rate. Call 800-923-3300. That's 800-923-3300 for the Wall Street Journal. Ready or not, here it comes. This may be your last chance to watch TLC or anything else. Whether the end comes by flood or famine or plague or worse or nothing at all. One thing is certain, this is the best place to wait and see. It's Y2K with TLC. Tune in for the end. The TLC Armageddon night beginning tonight and ending, well... Now, what are you going to do with all that canned food? That's so 20th century. What was that? It might be the furnace. It might be the foundation. Or it might be someone trying to get in. The only way to be sure is with this sound. A Security Link home security system from Ameritech. Security Link protects your home 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for less than a dollar a day. And if you call now, you can get a complete Security Link system installed absolutely free. That's free installation just by calling 1-800-523-7076. Imagine knowing your home is secure all day, every day, when you're away, when you're home alone, when you're lying in bed at night. So call 1-800-523-7076 and get a Security Link system installed absolutely free. Hurry, offer ends soon. Number 10. You're doing very well. The room-sized ENIAC, built in 1945, was one of the first computers. Before that, they would have a room with young women who were sitting down there doing computations with paper and pencil, and they were called the computers. Now they had something that worked at even lower wages because all you had to feed it was electricity, and it could do the computation much faster. A half century later, a quarter-inch microprocessor, a computer on a chip, is far more powerful than ENIAC and much cheaper. As computers have miniaturized, learned our languages, and begun to think, the uses have exploded. I regard the word processing aspects of computers as one of the glorious inventions of modern times. The kind of society that we're running now with its enormously complex interactions just would not be possible at all without computers. We're moving into a new age, and the computer revolution will be even more deep-running transformation than the Industrial Revolution. Nine. The dream of soaring like a bird is an ancient and powerful one. The changes brought about when that dream became reality have transformed the planet. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers set out to prove the gasoline-powered machine they'd designed could fly. In a world where horses were still the main form of transportation, Orville Wright, a 32-year-old bicycle mechanic, seemed mad even to attempt the stunt. And when the very flimsy Wright brothers' aeroplane, bits of uh, wood and cotton canvas first lifted off the ground at Kitty Hawk, the potential of it wasn't realized. Flight has shrunk the world in ways unimaginable. You can leave London in a bomber concourse and arrive in New York at a slightly earlier time than you left. No corner of the earth remains unchanged by flying machines. It's an astonishingly swift progress from that little bumpy ride on the North Carolina beach. Eight. Around the turn of the century, if a child was running a high fever, there was a very high likelihood that the child would die. There was very little you could do. You really didn't have any medicine. 
More people died from influenza epidemic of 1918 than were killed in action during World War I. It isn't the influenza itself that directly killed. It was the secondary pneumonia infections that followed. But there wasn't any specific treatment. But in 1928, a Petri dish in the lab of Scottish bacteriologist Alexander Fleming was contaminated by a mold that happened to drift in from a mycology lab on the floor below. Fleming noticed that the mold was producing a substance that was killing the infectious staph bacteria he'd been growing. Realizing the substance, which he named penicillin, might have medical applications, he kept the rare mold alive. Not until 10 years later did a team of Oxford University researchers figure out how to extract the penicillin from Fleming's mold in large quantities and prove it could be safely used to knock out bacterial infections. It was the world's first antibiotic. Today, if our child is sick, we take that child to the doctor to get some kind of pill or liquid, and within 24 hours, she's up and running around. The lives of countless people have been saved by an arsenal of antibiotics offering miraculous cures. Seven. In the early part of the century, 85% of the Earth's surface was colonized, controlled not in their own best interest by a more powerful industrialized nation. They didn't want to be servants of long-distance masters. These people wanted to be masters of their own fate like Gandhi in India, began to agitate. And by the end of the Second World War, the colonial powers had been so beaten down by the war, it just broke the system much faster than anybody expected. Within a generation, there were 60 new independent nations. Today, only 17 territories remain in the world. What people have won by getting themselves free of the colonial power has been, above all, a feeling of self-worth. As they began to take on some form of self-government, could feel that people like themselves were capable of doing anything. Six. At the turn of the century, it was assumed a woman would be a wife and a mother. Women who wanted to work faced very large obstacles. Many times, if the jobs were open, they were only open to single women. There were very powerful women's groups fighting for their rights. There was tremendous opposition. The most important thing for women in the 20th century was, of course, getting the vote. The surprising thing is that it took so long. The women were trapped in stereotypes. They were not mechanical, and they didn't have enough intelligence. Their place was in the home. In the early 60s, they were earning about half the pay of men for doing equal work. Women were barred from entering so many professions. When you look back at the progress that's been made, it's extraordinary. Five. Prior to the civil rights movement, black people lived in an almost exclusively self-contained world. I traveled to the United States in the 50s and was astonished to find I could not play chess with a black man or invite him to my hotel for a coffee. We the Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal. The great shame of the United States, the foul stain upon our history, is uh, racism. The injustice we have done to non-white peoples. For almost 60 years, a policy of separate but equal was legal, even according to the Supreme Court. And what the Civil Rights Movement was about was giving us the opportunity not to be treated unfairly or to receive things unduly, but to be allowed to compete person to person, same point on the starting line, with our peers, not just our black peers, but our American peers. Even after segregation was finally ruled illegal in 1954, when nine African-American teens tried to enroll in all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, President Eisenhower had to call out the National Guard to protect them. America as a whole was enormously fortunate. There arose a leader of real vision, and a vision which encompassed not just blacks, but everybody. I haven't seen 
anyone before and anyone since who had that charisma, that intelligence, that voice, the capacity to name a people's dreams and aspirations, to motivate normal, regular African Americans to put their lives on the line to fight white racism and segregation. And until that happened, segregation wasn't going to go away. In the spring of 63, when the police commissioner of Birmingham in Alabama set barking dogs and fire hoses against the nonviolent march. And that was televised all over the country and it really shocked people. That made possible the passage of civil rights legislation. Martin Luther King has made the most effective challenge to the bad conscience of the white majority. It's the first time in American history that a group of people use civil disobedience to insist upon and achieve their political rights. If you believe in democracy, and if you believe in equal rights, and you believe in justice, that all people should receive the same treatment and the same opportunity. It's the moral imperative of democracy. That one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. We shall One of the most dramatic changes in everyday life in the 20th century has been the spread of education. The literacy rates around the world have grown tremendously. Even authoritarian countries came to recognize that they needed a literate population to get through the ideas of clean water and hygiene and proper health. The idea that everyone was entitled to an education was one of the most democratic of all ideas. The prosperity in America was very much indeed to the opportunity it gave to veterans to get a free education, which wasn't true anywhere else in the world. But the most important thing in the 20th century is math education. If you could educate people, they wouldn't simply be taking orders, but they would be thinking for themselves. When we return, the countdown concludes with the three greatest achievements of the 20th century. This TLC program is sponsored in part by Sprint PCS. Experience the clear alternative to cellular. What was distinctive about World War II was that it was a genuine global war. Nowhere was sheltered. And secondly, it was the moral significance, a genuine fight against evil, against the murder of six million Jews, against a threat to civilization. After six terrible years of fighting, the war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945. I was in Paris on BE Day. It was an extraordinary experience. I've never seen so much sheer, unmitigated explosions of happiness. No one could quite believe that this nightmare was, was over. Four months later, the most devastating war in human history was over in the Pacific as well. The uh, Second World War ended the fascist threat, ended the threat of Japanese militarism, and gave democracy a new lease in life. Number two. Probably nothing has affected people's daily lives so much as electricity. At the start of the century, there was electricity in cities, but not most other places. If you were a typical person, Early in the century, you probably lived on a farm and you probably got up when there was daylight because you needed that light to go out and milk the cows. And then if it was plowing season, you'd spend most of the day following the rear end of a horse. And that was what your life was like. With the coming of electricity, lives changed dramatically. The electric light is the first great achievement. The public is called a conquest of the night. And that was true to a certain extent. We're colonizing the night. The night is a frontier and people are moving into it. The woman got up and if it was Monday, it was wash day. And Monday was wash day because she spent a lot of Monday washing. And then Tuesday was ironing day and she put the iron on the stove and when it was hot enough, she ironed. 
And it's really electricity more than anything else that has freed us from so much of this drudgery. It just changed everyday life in so many aspects that it's difficult to imagine what lives must have been like without electricity. That electrification is still going on. But now at the end of the century, most of the world's work gets done by electrical power. Number one. The turn of the century, the idea of going into space was nobody thought about it at all. It seemed totally impossible. When I was growing up, we read H.G. Wells, we read Jules Verne. The whole concept of space was enormously compelling. Mid-century, one of the early V-2 rocket shoots came back with the first photographs of the Earth taken from the upper atmosphere. You lived on the Earth and you knew it was a planet in space, but for somebody to actually bring back a photograph and show just that curve of the horizon was somehow, wow, you know, it, it really is round, it really is a globe. On April 12, 1961, a 27-year-old Soviet Air Force pilot named Yuri Gagarin became the first person to leave our globe and blast into space. No doubt here that the big milestones were the first launching of a human being into orbit, which is Yuri Gagarin, and then, of course, the landing on the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. When Kennedy promised we would get to the moon before the end of the decade, well, I was impressed by the fact that his science advisor believed that this was possible. A distinguished scientist thought it was possible. I went along with it. But still, it seemed to me inconceivable. On July 20th, 1969, the inconceivable happened. The moon was up there in space. It was the silvery disk. It was a goddess. And for a human being to land on it had just a psychological significance, a mythological significance that said, we've done something, we've made it, we've left the world of myth, we're stepping on this thing. This is something for the rest of the lifetime of the human race. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. Some of those first pictures taken back from the moon showing this beautiful blue marble out in space gave people a different way of looking at things, brought home to people what an oasis this is. In the 70s, we began probing further out into the solar system and beyond, sending home pictures and data, and sending out messages of welcome to other worlds. The idea that we could actually do this shows a kind of capability that people really had not imagined that human beings had. It's created the whole possibility of life elsewhere in the universe. There's no question the next place to go is to planets around other stars. I think the idea that there might be other life out there is so compelling that sooner or later, and we're going to go out there, Five hundred years from now, people looking back on the 20th century will remember it most of all as a century where man burst the terrestrial bonds and began the exploration of space. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. 